Uh, so hello everyone. I'm very glad to uh, to see too many people here, and uh, I am really glad that we have uh, I have an opportunity to speak uh, uh, from my beloved Wix Engineering, the company I work, and uh, to talk about the stuff I uh, have been working for some time. It's about Kotlin and gRPC. Uh, so before we start, let me introduce myself briefly. So my name is Margarita. I work as software engineer at Wix. I also an active community member. Uh, sometimes I organize different events. I'm in program committee. Unfortunately, because of current situation, we suspended uh, some of our events, but I hope that in nearest future we will have the opportunity to organize all of them. And uh, I hope I'll see all of you in person there. I also sometimes write posts in Medium and in Twitter, so you can follow me. Uh, one more really important thing you should know about me uh, is that I like boxing, and at some point quarantine will end and we'll meet in person, so think twice before asking tricky questions. Uh, so, of course, it was a joke. I won't hit anyone today. And today uh, we'll talk about uh, GRPC a little bit, because as far as I understand, uh, a lot of people uh, still don't know what it is and how to work with it. Uh, but if you know, uh, you'll just memorize it. Uh, and then we'll implement some very simple service to understand how to use it. And after that, we'll talk about how to use your PC and coroutines together. And uh, then we'll talk more about specific GRPC and Kotlin libraries, uh, what the state of these libraries and uh, what can be improved, what can be added, and so on. So let's begin. Uh, in the very beginning, uh, if you started your career, I guess, like uh, 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago, or even five, uh, you probably wrote Monolith. And it was uh, like the only way to write your applications. And uh, then, like in some time, uh, Monolith split it into microservices. So one Monolith split into millions and millions of microservices. So who writes microservices today? I guess almost everyone today is writing microservices. And it's a huge trend, and uh, there are a lot of talks, a lot of people on the conference, they're talking about why microservices is cool, and uh, there are a lot of workshops about microservices and so on, so on. Um, there are also a lot of problems with microservices. We'll also talk about it. But uh, actually, it solves uh, a lot of problems. So, uh, with the high load, so uh, microservices today uh, is a really big trend, and uh, I think that almost all of you have heard about it. Uh, so why uh, do they like microservices so much? Because it broke. Uh, first of all, uh, when you're doing microservices, you can be independent because you can divide your uh, big uh, application into smaller parts, uh, into logical parts, and implement them uh, uh, independently from each other. So you can split it into different teams and even uh, your teams could be very separated and be in different continents, different countries, and it uh, really um, makes your development process fast. Uh, of course, when you have microservices, uh, we can talk about being more scalable uh, because uh, scaling small parts is easier than scaling big parts. It's not just easier, it's cheaper because you can still be scalable with Monolith, but uh, it's uh, it's expensive. So with microservices, you can uh, like configure which services you need more instances, so which services you need less instances. And uh, by doing this, you like uh, save your money and uh, your, uh, use, your, uh, use your infrastructure more uh, uh, like, uh, efficiently. And of course, when we are talking about microservices, uh, you can understand that you can choose uh, the best suitable tool. For example, one service can be written in Scala, another service can be written in Kotlin, another in Java, Python, Node.js, uh, and so on, so on. And you can write microservices in Go, and it will work together in one big project because uh, uh, you're just uh, using something else to communicate. You need to define some contract to communicate, and so on. You uh, you don't have to be on the same uh, language and in the same platform. Uh, as I already told you, you can be independent and you can develop the small parts of uh, your application in parallel. And of course, it uh, makes your development um, 
more fast and more efficient. And so on, so on. You can talk about microservices a lot because it rocks and it uh, solves a lot of problems. And actually, today, uh, almost all modern big companies with a uh, big high load, they're using microservices. Uh, but we cannot talk only about pros of microservices. There is, uh, there are a lot of uh, like problems with microservices. There are a lot of problems that caused by using microservices that we didn't have in Monolith. And uh, there is one big problem that I want to talk about today. It's communication. So the biggest issue in changing the Monolith into microservices lies in changing the communication pattern. Uh, actually, it's not my words. Uh, it was said by Martin Fowler, a very smart guy. He uh, had a lot of different articles about monolith microservices, and one of the most famous is how to refactor monolith into microservice. Uh, so why do we are we talking a lot about problems in communication? Uh, when we are talking about microservices, we should understand that we are using network. Uh, because in order to communicate between your small parts of your application, you are using a network. A network is something that is not reliable by default. Uh, so uh, I think that during the situation with COVID-19, you'll probably find out that uh, there are a lot of stuff that we can do online, but uh, we uh, like depend a lot on our uh, internet connection. And uh, this connection, this network uh, is not reliable. There are a lot of ways how it can be broken. And the same stuff is uh, with microservices. So uh, it can be broken all the time and we have to like go work somehow in this situation and need to handle it. Uh, it's the stuff that we haven't in Monolith, but we have it a lot in microservices. Uh, so today uh, for using um, microservices, uh, a lot of people are working with HTTP 1.1 and REST. And I hope that if I would ask uh, all of you this question, you'll probably say that, yes, we're using HTTP 1 and REST. Uh, why that's so? Because it's like the most common, the most simple way to do so. And it works. And actually, in the, at Wix, we also use an HTTP 1 and REST. Uh, not everywhere, but uh, there are some points where we use it. And uh, uh, why do we need something else? Actually, it works. It's OK. And it solves our problems. Um, but there is like one uh, problem that big companies, for example, like Wix or other companies can um, face. Uh, at Wix, we have like millions, uh, I guess 170 millions of users. And during this pandemic, we get more and more users every day. And that's how we have a lot of uh, requests per minute and we need to handle them. And that's why we need more and more servers, more and more servers. And the problem is that it's, it costs money. So uh, the more clients we have, the more servers we need to have, the more money we spend on our infrastructure. And actually, I'm not OK with this situation because I want company to spend more on my salary than on infrastructure. But we have uh, like these millions of dollars into infrastructure. And maybe there is a way how we can reduce our cost and infrastructure by doing minimum changes. Uh, and uh, there is a way how to reduce your costs to make your communication more efficient. So in order to make your communication more efficient, we can use gRPC. It's not the only way how to do so, and it's, uh, but it's one of the ways uh, that works and that you can work with. So let's discover a little bit what is gRPC. Um, uh, do you know, by the way, what gRPC stands for? As far as uh, we know, it's the uh, acronym. So uh, uh, when I first met this uh, acronym, I thought that it's Google Remote Procedure Call. Uh, so, uh, but it was not true because they decided that gRPC is a recursive acronym and gRPC meant gRPC Remote Procedure Call. And uh, as for me, it's a stupid solution. And uh, like developers at Google, I guess, and marketing thought that it's a stupid solution too. So they decided that uh, they won't uh, say that G is gRPC. Uh, and they decided to create a new, uh, like new meaning of the first letter of this acronym uh, for each new um, 
or a new release. So each new release, we have a new uh, meaning for the first letter of gRPC. I think that at some point, they will just run out of words on the letter G. Uh, but uh, I don't know. So we just like for uh, general information for you. So let's move forward. And uh, that was about G, but what is RPC? Uh, you probably heard about RPC, especially in Java, you heard about Corba, RMI, and some other stuff uh, that was like very painful and there, there were much code to write in order to uh, work with Corba and RMI and so on. And for most of the people, RPC sounds something like hell, something like pain and disaster and so on. So people don't like usually RPC. Uh, so RPC, it's like the new way to do so. Uh, so it's like a meaning of RPC. Uh, you can read it. Uh, when I share my slides, then let's skip it. Uh, so GRPC is the way how to do this remote procedure calls, but uh, without, with less pain than we, than we did it uh, 10 years ago. So it's like a remote procedure call, but smarter and efficient. So what features do we have at GRPC in order to make it so cool? Uh, first of all, GRPC is built on top of HTTP2. Uh, so we won't talk a lot about HTTP2. Let's have a brief overview of its history. So in 91, we had HTTP 0.9. And in 96, it was 1.0. In uh, 97, it was 1.1. Then no progress, no progress, no progress, no new releases. Maybe they're not alive. And suddenly, in 2015, HTTP2 appeared. So, and said that I am alive. Of course, it's a joke. It doesn't mean that they did nothing for like, for 17 years. They uh, did a good job. They, they worked this protocol. But what I'm trying to tell you that most of us are using HTTP 1.1, the protocol that is not so like relevant to our new reality. Uh, because it's 21st century and we are all working with a uh, big high load, but we are still using HTTP 1. That is what developed in and designed in 97th year. So we probably should rethink this. And I even can say that there is a HTTP 3 in the third version. So you can uh, even look into it. Uh, it's not supported by GRPC still and by some of the browsers, but you can still that uh, see that we have this uh, evolution of the protocol and we can should look into it and discover it more. Uh, so that's about HTTP2. Why it's so cool? First of all, because finally we have this single TCP connection. Uh, talking about HTTP1, there wasn't a single TCP connection. When you created a new connection per request, there was property keep alive, but uh, it had like small team out and then it, you still had to create this new connection. And of course, it uh, takes your time and takes your resources, which is not very cool. Uh, so uh, as far as we have one connection opened all the time, we can use bi-directional streaming. So now client and the server can stream to each other a lot of messages using the same connection. So it's like a WebSocket, but without WebSocket. So we don't need a WebSocket because we can use, do it just using HTTP2. And uh, one more cool feature that is actually uh, also implemented gRPC is flow control. Uh, flow control is uh, um, the way to solve a problem when your client and your server cannot handle um, the communication properly. Uh, for example, uh, you might have different um, uh, like devices, for example, mobile devices, like, uh, like, uh, iPads and so on, and they are not so efficient. And uh, sometimes it's hard for them to handle all the requests server is streaming to them. And by doing flow control, you can request some, uh, you can handle a couple of requests and uh, like ask server to like stop and then you resume and handle other requests. So like it helps you to uh, handle all the client requests into uh, efficient space. So your client won't be down and your customers uh, won't be unhappy. They will be happy. 
the next thing about that's all about HTTP2 because it's actually cool stuff, but we won't talk a lot about it because our talk is not about HTTP2, it's about GRPC and Kotlin. Uh, so GRPC also supports a lot of languages. So there is an implementation for, um, uh, for Java, uh, for Go, for Python, for Ruby, and so on. And of course, it's for Kotlin and for uh, Scala. Uh, so uh, it's uh, widely adopted and uh, like uh, new and new libraries for using GRPC with other programming langu languages are appearing. And if your language uh, favorite language is not listed here, you can still implement your uh, own library, work with it. Uh, and uh, one more cool thing about GRPC, uh, that it's binary because HTTP protocol, HTTP2 protocol is binary and protobuf, which is used inside GRPC, it's uh, interface definition language is also uh, builds a binary messages. So uh, sending bytes is cheaper than sending strings and uh, having a single connection and sending bytes via it you can understand that GRPC can provide you with uh, more efficient communications uh, than uh, HTTP 1. So let's proceed. Uh, at, uh, Java, it's like the language that most of us uh, have been using for a long time, especially uh, me too, because uh, before working with Scala and Kotlin, I also was working as Java developer, and Java is still widely a common language for most of the program, for most of the applications. And Java likes GRPC. I mean, there is an implementation GRPC Java, and you can use GRPC in your Java applications. Uh, so, at Wix, we like GRPC too. Uh, there is one thing at Wix. Uh, we use GRPC, but we do not use Java because we use Scala. Unfortunately, Scala is not supported like by default by GRPC, and uh, we needed to have some stuff uh, to support this GRPC at Wix. And uh, there is a library called Scala PB for Protobuf. We also built a lot of stuff on top of that uh, Scala PB. And uh, we are using GRPC with Scala PB and Scala, and it, it works well for us. And we're happy. Uh, so, and uh, we used Wix at GRPC, and at some point we uh, like thought, uh, that Kotlin is a language that is growing and its popularity is growing very fast. Maybe there is a way that we uh, have to look into it somehow. Or maybe we can invest some time into investigation of this uh, language. And we uh, thought about how is it possible actually to make Wix, GRPC and Kotlin together. And uh, that's what I was working a little at Wix. And that's what uh, we uh, how the stock actually appeared. Uh, so we discovered GRPC. We even discovered why we're talking about GRPC and Kotlin. So let's talk a little bit uh, about protocol buffers. I already told you that GRPC is binary and it uses protocol buffers inside. So what it is? Uh, protocol buffers is uh, Google's language natural platform natural mechanism for serializing structured data. Uh, what does it mean? Um, so uh, for like sending some uh, messages, for uh, serializing messages, we use in JSON, XML, or uh, something like this. So protobuf, it's the way to serialize your data, your messages. Uh, but as far as Google says, it's uh, faster, smaller, and simpler. So uh, how does it work? Let's talk a little bit. Uh, first of all, you should define your sample profile. Uh, you can see this uh, small example. Uh, here it is uh, service greeter, uh, RPC call say hello, which has hello request and hello reply. Uh, in hello request, we have only one uh, field, its name, which is string. And in hello reply, we have uh, also one field, which is string is message. And when you wrote this file, 
uh, the metric is happening. So you compile this file using some protobuf plugins for your language, and they are compiled to actually classes and interfaces and other structures in language that you are using. For example, if you use Java plugin, uh, it will be compiled in Java. If you're using Go plugin, it will be Go, uh, and so on, so on. So uh, there are some like the most common and popular languages here, but there is more and more. Uh, so uh, let's a little bit summarize its features. Uh, as far as our language that we are talking about, uh, like Java, Scala, Kotlin, are type safe. Our messages that are generated from protobuf are also type safe. So you cannot pass uh, something of your own type because you have like a, you have compiled time error. Uh, the same thing is uh, about no schema violations uh, because uh, our language is type safe. And you cannot pass different uh, other message types into your PC call because you have uh, your errors during your compilation. And uh, uh, Protobuf also has fast and uh, serialization and deserialization uh, because it just bytes and uh, it's backward compatible. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, all the fields of our messages in Protobuf are optional. And if, because in GPC we are talking about protobuf version 3 and all the uh, fields are optional. And as far as fields are optional, you can easily add new fields and you can deprecate old fields. So that's how it works. So, uh, but the only problem is human readability. So if at some point you want to catch the message between two services, uh, you get bytes. And if you cannot read bytes, uh, you're in trouble because you cannot uh, understand what's going on. So if you need this human readability, you need to think about something else. Uh, so uh, that's all about Protobuf. Let's talk about how we can implement some simple service. Uh, as far as a big desktop file, so you can see uh, I have this BB-8 robot here. And actually, I like the Star, I like uh, Star Wars very much. And I decided that they need um, Death Star, this tiny little Death Star that can uh, ruin the world. When, uh... So uh, I already wrote the application. Uh, so let's discuss about uh, uh, which flows we have in this application. The first flow is when user joins. So uh, when some customer goes to my application, uh, he wants to our uh, Death Star. And our Death Star goes to our planet service. And in planet service, we need to get all the planets that are currently alive in our solar system. So we have this, all the planets and we paint them for our customer in order to, uh, in order our customer to see the whole universe. Uh, then we subscribe for logs and for, uh, scores table. And after that, we in stream, we receive, uh, uh, the stream of logs and stream of uh, scores. Uh, so you can understand that all this, uh, the, all these calls are asynchronous and that's why we receive all the data asynchronously. So it looks like we're using some kind of web socket, but it, we don't, you're not using web socket because it's like, um, under HTTP2. It's one flow. And the next flow is when user can destroy the planet. So user goes to a planet uh, to this application. He see all these planets uh, painted into the window. And when uh, we click on some planet and planet was destroyed, what do we have? We go to the planet service, uh, to the Death Star service. Then we go to the planet service and remove one planet. And after that, uh, as far as we a little bit cheater, we not, don't want our universe to die uh, at all. So we generate a new planet. When new planet is generated, so new planet is generated, we log everything and we update scores because if user destroyed some planet, his score is going upper and he receives some, uh, uh, some points. And of course, we notify user about all this stuff asynchronously. So let's implement. First of all, we need to define proto file. Uh, we will implement only the star service because it's like the, the most interesting part of the application. 
And this star service, they have only one method, which is called destroy, which is a streaming application. It's bi-directional streaming. We have destroy planet requests, uh, which is streaming of requests, and we return the stream of planets, uh, which is uh, stream. So it's bi-directional streaming. Uh, you also can see that in uh, proto files, you can import other proto files. So let's look into this proto file and see what's inside. So inside this proto file, we just uh, describe messages. We have message planet, which has planet ID, name, date, and image. So it's very simple. Uh, then we have planets. And inside planets, we have repeated planets. So when we say repeated, it means that our planet is a list of planets. And we have destroy planet request, which means use, which has username and switch user. Destroyed the planet, planet ID, which planet was destroyed and the weight. Actually, how much does this planet weight and how many points uh, our user, our user received. So then when we wrote this proto file, uh, we have some magic and we have our proto files generated. As far as we remember, uh, Kotlin is not supported uh, by default by gRPC. Uh, we have to use gRPC Java. So that's why all these classes are generated in Java. It's the star service gRPC, the star proto, planet proto, and so on. Uh, actually, there are a lot of ugly code here. I don't want you to look into it. So let's proceed. Uh, just you should remember that all this stuff is generated in Java. So how can we use it? Uh, let's implement the method destroy. First of all, uh, in order to subscribe to our stuff, we add our clients to our uh, listeners. So here it is. Here is a list of our listeners and we add our client there. Uh, then we go to another planet. So it's another microservice. So in this time, we are like a client of another microservice and we get all the planets. And, uh, sorry. We get all the planets and we, uh, send them to our user in order to paint the whole universe. And after that, we return the stream of uh, planets. So how do we get the stream of planets? Let's look into it a little bit more. As far as I already told you, our destroy method is a bi-directional streaming method. So our destroy request is not just one request. We have like stream of requests. And we also have to return stream of responses. So destroy method is just the mechanism how we handle uh, incoming requests and how we are sending our request to our client. Uh, in order to do so, uh, if you're using gRPC Java, we have well, no other option than to use callbacks. Uh, so we are returning the stream observer and inside stream observer, we are having method on next. And inside this method on next, we are just describing our callback. So first of all, we are removing planet. Then we add score. After that, we look that we destroyed the planet. After that, we generate a new planet. And you can see that as far as we are using the result of generated planet, we have to define the callback again. So here it is. Here it is. And we log that we are generated a new planet. And when the planet generated, we are uh, going to planets. Uh, next microservices and the next, next microservice. We get all the planets that we have the, in the universe and we repaint them to our clients. So we return it to our client and we notify all our clients uh, about new planet. So here it is, the stream method is done. So the stream method looks this way. Uh, is there something strange with this method? Uh, I see one strange thing. It's here. It have uh, this method has this ugly, ugly, very ugly um, shape. How, how does this situation is called? This situation is called callback hell. Uh, why does it happen? Because we, when we need to use the result of previous operation, 
and to work with it asynchronously, we are creating a callback. And if we are doing a lot of different steps, like we do in this destroy method, uh, we need to write a lot of a lot of callbacks. And you can see that uh, this way, and now our method looks this way, and it's very ugly. And uh, sometimes you can like, uh, you don't even need to scroll it uh, up down, you need to scroll it from left to right, and it's really ugly and a bad situation. So in Java, callback hell is not something you want to achieve. And uh, of course in Kotlin and uh, in Scala as well. So. How can we handle it? And here comes to PC and coroutines. So in order to like handle all the stuff, let's uh, talk about how can we benefit from using coroutines. So first thing is why don't we use futures? So uh, if we are using futures, uh, you can do it via gRPC. Um, now you can see that uh, the first step is the same. So we still add uh, observer, our uh, client to our listeners list. Uh, then you can see that we are started with coroutine. We launched a coroutine. And instead of generating a callback here, uh, we can um, have method await and uh, get all planets asynchronously uh, using this extension wait. And then you see that you don't have a callback here. So. Uh, but the problem is that we still have to work with stream observer. So here with stream observer, let's look inside what's going on. Uh, we still have this callback on next. So we have the planet stop, we remove planet, we add score, we destroy planet, we generate a new planet, and uh, you can see that we uh, don't need a callback this way because we are using method await. And we uh, log about new planet and uh, notify all our listeners about it. So the problem is uh, that we handled almost all the callbacks and uh, rewrote it into origins, uh, despite the only one, uh, this one. And so why does it happen? Uh, because when we are talking about your PC Java, there is no other way to handle bidirectional streaming than to do uh, to return stream of error. Uh, but, uh, and from like some time, it was like the only option, uh, unless you should write some, something on your own, some of your own libraries. Um, yeah. And for uh, like a uh, year and a half ago, it was uh, one, the only point how you can do this uh, bidirectional streaming in Kotlin and in Java. Uh, so you can see that the stream method now looks this way, but the shape a little bit flattened, but it's still, uh, it's not that bad that it was, but it's still not ideal. So here comes your PC and quarantine part two. So as I already told you, one year and a half ago, we had this, uh, the only thing how to work with uh, uh, bi-directional streaming by using stream observers. But then uh, some magic started happening. And so uh, a lot of Kotlin developers and uh, other developers uh, who understand that working with stream observer is not that cool, they say that who we are, we are Kotlin developers. Uh, what do they want? We want channels. Uh, channels is the mechanism, it's a primitive for communicating between origins. Oh, how does it can help us? Uh, by using channels, we can avoid using stream observer and callbacks, and we can um, write our code in the way that our requests and our responses is just uh, we can work with it as it's a list. But uh, finally, it's not a list, it's asynchronous stuff. So for doing this, we need a new hero, a new hero appeared. Code your PC Kotlin. Uh, when if First thought about it, I thought it's official GPC Kotlin library from Google, but unfortunately it was not so. But uh, I actually started using it. And let's look into what happened. And the stream method for now looks this way. Uh, first of all, we create channel. Uh, why? Because uh, in this our destroy method, we receive requests 
and we have to return request. So we see that we receive only one parameter request and we have to return receive channel. So we receive channel and we uh, return channel. In order to return channel, we need to create it somehow. So we create this channel and we need to add our channel to the listeners. So it's clear. And what's happening inside? Um, then inside other origin. So what do we do? We send into our channel uh, all planets in order to um, in order to paint it for the first time. And then we are iterating over requests and it's uh, a list. So you see that we have this core cycle and we are looking into requests like it's a list or some uh, some collection. But it's not collection. It's a synchronous channel. So this stuff will work um, when we receive some request from our client. And inside this channel, we can remove planet, add score, uh, destroy planet, generate new planet log, and notify all the listeners. So our method looks this way. So it uh, it's much more clear. You can see that uh, in this method, we have only business logic. So there is uh, less noise. You see that we remove planet, we add score, we log, we generate new, and we notify. So we see only business logic here and less of noise. And our Dart Raider is happy. But wait a minute. Uh, at the same point as GRPC Kotlin appeared, another library appeared called Grota Plus. It just solved the same problem, but in different way. Uh, so uh, this is how, how it looks. And it's method destroy. Uh, we add, uh, do the same stuff. We add listener store response channel, but the thing that changed is that we are not returning a response channel. We have both channels in our arguments. So we have two arguments. It's a request channel and response channel. But inside we do the same stuff, except we do not return the channel. So uh, the only thing that changed for us, like clients of this library, is that uh, the signature changed and we do not need to return the channel. But under the hood, it works uh, like, uh, the same. It's also stable, and it even has more and more stuff to uh, to work with and to extend this library. And I prefer this library more. And uh, for a lot, for many time, when I talked about this uh, GRPC and Kotlin stuff, it was the end. So uh, it was uh, like the final uh, like with the sensum of their uh, my project and so on. So there was nothing else to talk about. But recently, we have something new. Uh, I guess in 16th of, on 16th of April, GRPC announced that we, they are support Kotlin officially now. And they have this GRPC Kotlin official library. And I say that I have to work with it and I need to work with it. So I decided to rewrite the whole my project to use this GRPC Kotlin new stuff. So I was writing um, some code. I spent some evening to migrate it and what I found. Uh, first of all, you can see that uh, in this method, we are they're not using uh, channels. We are using flows. Uh, if you don't know what is flow, you should probably look into some uh, talks from Roman Yelizarov, who explains uh, more about coroutines and flows and channels and so on. So flow is a new way of uh, having this uh, like, of um, it's like a channel, uh, but channel represents a hot channel, uh, but flow is cold. So flow is lazy. And it solves a lot of problems of the of channels who are not lazy. Uh, so another uh, what changed? Changed flow from um, the previous code. We changed channel to flow, and of course we need to create this flow. Uh, so we have to add to listeners not request, but we add to listeners this. That's something that changed. And instead of uh, send via channel, we use an init. And here, uh, instead of using for loop, we are using request collect. So 
this is the only thing that changed for my application in order to make it work with uh, GPC Kotlin official from Google. So I was very happy with what I did. But what, when I find out that it is crap, I launched my application. It was okay, but it didn't work. So it compiled, it built it, everything launched. But when I tried to do something, it wasn't work. So uh, what did I see in my logs? I see a lot of that stuff. I was very unhappy. But then I find out some uh, the most uh, interesting part. And so we are, we are using flow collector, which is not thread safe inside, inside the, this flow. And we cannot concurrently emission it from different coroutines. So, uh, there is a solution to do it from one, uh, exact thread, or we should, uh, use kernel flow instead of flow. I tried it to, I decided to go the simplest way and to change it from my flow to the channel flow. Uh, so, actually, it's very useful to read logs. And uh, what I did, in we still have these flows here and here. Instead of flow, I changed flow to channel flow. And instead of emit, I used send. So, it works, uh, actually. It compiles. It was okay. And then I started my server, and again, I find another bunch of exceptions. Uh, so what I see that closed send channel exception channel was closed. Uh, so what happened? As far as our application is asynchronous, as uh, has a lot of users and uh, so on, uh, what ha what's happening? When you try to delete some planet, uh, we need to notify all other users. And to, when we are doing this, all our uh, we are using like the uh, the channel flows so that were um, here in our listeners. But the problem is, for some reason, our channel flow was, our channel was already closed. Because if we don't wait until it's closed, we have to, uh, it's closed and we cannot use it. So in order to handle this, we need to write, to read some documentation in this about coroutines and uh, add a wait close here. And when we add a wait close, actually everything is okay and you can enjoy destroying planets. So let's talk a little bit more about libraries for Kotlin and gRPC because we finally get our service implemented and we can move forward. So when I first uh, was working with GPC and Kotlin, I thought that uh, all the libraries would be as cool as this my tiny robot. But unfortunately, uh, it were a little bit stupid, were a little bit uh, not ready, and uh, I had to work with something that is not ready for production at all. So let's talk a little bit. The first library I was talking about is GPC Kotlin. Uh, I uh, for the first time when I used it and I looked at it, I thought that it's official Kotlin library, but unfortunately it's, it's not official library. Uh, it's a private repository. The version was 0.0.2. .0 and there was a warning that uh, says that this is a prototype, blah, 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 blah. So please don't use me. Don't use me, just uh, PRs are welcome. I was a little bit upset because when, if I go to my company to my like uh, technical leads architects and say that I want to use this library which is of version 002 and with this warning they say that I'm stupid and of course we um, won't use it uh, but uh, in a few months a uh, huge work was done in this library uh, it was version of 012 and I guess now it's like oh, 002 something uh, and actually, for the long time, I guess till uh, April of uh, 2012, the whole my application, which I had done for many times and which was in production for many uh, months, and uh, I played many conferences, it was fully written using this library. It was stable and everything was great. So uh, it was cool and it is a cool, a simple library for working with your PC and Kotlin. Uh, the next uh, 
uh, like player here is Crota Plus. It's another library that solves the same problem, um, but uh, slightly in a different way. Uh, so of course, a year ago, uh, it was not actually ready for production at all. So it was 0 0.1.3 and, um, and so on. But then uh, it changed. Uh, we had like community on Slack, we had uh, a new logo, and of course, a lot of uh, much work was done here. And uh, I reviewed a lot of uh, things here, and I see that this library is awesome because uh, um, if you're using GPC Kotlin, you're using only the stuff of uh, like simple stuff, you're just using it like a a simple line. But if you want to do more, if you want some extensions, if you want to uh, to influence of the generation of Proto, uh, you should probably try Proto Plus because it has a lot of mechanism how you can ex extend it. And I really like it. And uh, I also did uh, half of the project using this Proto library. Uh, but in April 16, as I already told you, there is an official GRPC Kotlin library from Google. Uh, it's just, uh, it still has not like first release, so you can even see that build error here. Uh, but, uh, you can contribute there, you can uh, look into it, and having two previous libraries, uh, as an example, you can change some, they can change some stuff and, uh, like, learn on their mistakes. So I'm really happy that this library appeared, not because this library is very cool, but it's really cool because I really will appreciate the way of working with flows instead of channels. Uh, but it means that uh, finally GRPC looks into Kotlin uh, as a first class citizen, uh, which makes me happy very much. Uh, there are also some useful links. Uh, GRPC Kotlin Compute Reactive GRPC. It's two Salesforce repositories where you can contribute uh, if you don't use Kotlin or Scala or something like this, but you want to use uh, the activity with Java, uh, you can use it here uh, and contribute here and uh, use it in your projects. Uh, there is also another way of working with Protobuf, PBNK. It's for Protobuf and Kotlin, especially in uh, multi-platform projects. And here is a, a link to my project, GRPC the Star, uh, which is actually yesterday was moved to Gradle Kotlin DSL. So you can enjoy it. And uh, the last link is a link about performance, because uh, at Wix we haven't done this uh, 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 like investigation with uh, how much uh, GRPC influenced our performance. Uh, but here you can see the comparison between GRPC and uh, HTTP 1 plus REST performance and understand when, uh, where you need GRPC and where you don't need. Because there are ways where GRPC can be worse than REST plus HTTP 1. Uh, so, a uh, few, like a year and year and a half ago, when I uh, started to talk about GRPC and Kotlin, where we didn't have a lot of support, uh, I was praying that one day we'll have a stable Kotlin support. And today, I say that we have a stable Kotlin support because we have these two cool libraries, which actually can work in production and are pretty stable. And we have official support from Google, which, uh, which is really cool. So we have the Scotland support. And it's time to summarize. Uh, there are some points that I want you to take from my presentation. First of all, use GRPC for effective communication. So if um, you need to have this effective communication, you need to reduce your costs and uh, you see that uh, you have some problems there, uh, maybe you should uh, take a look into GRPC. And then uh, in, on JVM, GRPC plus Scotland can be used today. As you can see, there are a lot of options how to work with it. And GRPC plus Kotlin makes things uh, easier. So uh, you see that uh, in Java, using the stream of servers, we have this ugly callbacks. And now uh, we don't have them. We have on, we have this beautiful channels, flows, and origins, and so on. 
And of course, we are waiting for first releases for flows, and uh, I mean for first release of official libraries, and of course for releases of uh, these two libraries uh, like GPC Kotlin and Quota Plus, which is also awesome. And of course, feel free to contribute um, because it's all of this stuff is open source and uh, it's developed uh, by developers who take their free time to do so. No one pays them. And uh, of course, it's uh, cool when developers work on this stuff and help each other to make the world better. So feel free to contribute, feel free to share your ideas uh, because uh, we need it. We need it to be better and to make products better. And the last point, don't use your PC. Uh, because uh, when we are talking uh, after all my presentation, you might think that your PC is a silver bully and you can use it everywhere and be happy and uh, be on top of the world. But actually, it's not true because uh, there are uh, ways, there are situations where your PC can help you and can increase your performance and can um, reduce your costs and make your life happier. But there are ways where it doesn't help. So don't use your PC if you don't need it. Only when you need it. When you, only if you have high load, only if you see that you have this problem in communication. And there's time to say thank you. Uh, there are a lot of people who inspired me, who helped me, uh, who altered actually these uh, libraries. And I uh, should have mentioned them here because they did a clear job behind my presentation. And there are also uh, people who help me with my presentation to prepare it better, to make my slides not that ugly. And of course, I should say thank you to this guy who is the father of, of Star Wars and who like inspired me to make this presentation this way. And one more big thank you to Wix Engineering. I think you all should clap to them because of organizing this event, because of letting me talk here and to meet all of you and share my experience with you. Uh, so thank you. And of course, thank you my participants who uh, survived this talk, uh, listened to me for all this time and were attentive, I hope. And I hope you'll find something interesting after that.